Crypto mining giant Marathon Digital Holdings reporting quarterly net losses of over $191 million as Bitcoin prices slid by over 50% in the period, triggering an almost $130 million impairment on its Bitcoin holdings. Joining us now to discuss is Fred Thiel. He's the CEO of Marathon Digital Holdings. Welcome to the show, Fred. So I guess we'll start off, you know, are you surprised by the losses or is it as you expected because of the market downturn and the power crisis in Texas? Well, I mean, in our case, the bulk of that loss was the markdown in the value of our Bitcoin holdings. You know, we sit on over 10,000 Bitcoin roughly. And when there's a big move in the price of Bitcoin, unfortunately, due to the way accounting treatment works, we can only mark it down. We don't get the chance to mark it to market. So when the price goes up, we don't get the benefit of recording, um, recording the positive side of it. So, you know, it's unfortunate. But at the end of the day, I think for most investors and analysts, if they look at the numbers and the details of the release, they'll see that, uh, you know, the, the bulk of this was the impairment. And then another part was because we're exiting our hardened facility in Montana, we have to write down the, essentially, the um, investment we made in the data center there uh, completely as of the date we exit, as opposed to over the five years, uh, which would have been normal. So there's an acceleration there of that. Um, but other than that, it was as expected. All right. So the you're right. When you hear the number, it sounds like a huge decline. But I wonder, how does it compare to previous downturns? Um, well, you know, Marathon hasn't been uh, a miner, really, uh, of scale in previous downturns. And we certainly weren't a holder. We started hodling Bitcoin, really, in 2020. So we don't have a historical you know, comparison uh, on our side. But, um, you know, one thing that, you know, people should think about is, you know, when you're holding Bitcoin, as we do and not selling it, um, then you know you get the benefit of it when the market goes up and you unfortunately get the, uh, the downside of it when the market goes down. But I think as you look at kind of studies over a five-year period of time, um, really the ideal scenario for most miners, and I did a presentation on this uh, at a conference uh, last month, basically uh, for miners, you know, if you just hold your Bitcoin um, and versus you sell your Bitcoin, uh, holding it has some benefit, but actually selling a portion of your Bitcoin as you produce um, Bitcoin to pay your operating expenses generates the best long-term return for miners because you're not having to now go out and raise capital to fund your operating expenses. You're essentially covering your operating costs through selling some Bitcoin. So I think what you're going to see is most miners going forward, as opposed to being hodlers, or sellers, they're going to do a hybrid. Well, they'll sell a certain portion of their Bitcoin produced each month um, to cover their operating expenses, and then they'll hodl the profits, if you would. Uh, that would change if Bitcoin were to all of a sudden start running up to 40000 and 50000 At that point, everybody becomes a hodler again because uh, you know, your cost of capital, your weighted average cost of capital um, you know, would be 15 or 20%. And if Bitcoin's rising at a faster rate than that, you're not going to sell any Bitcoin. So. Well, it is interesting that Marathon is holding onto its Bitcoin rather than selling because a lot of other miners are selling. According to Arcane Research, Bitcoin miners sold 400% of their BTC production in June. So how is Marathon able to hold on where other miners are capitulating? Well, you know, it's, it comes down to liquidity and uh, financing. You know, Marathon has a fairly clean balance sheet in that, um, you know, as we talked about on the call, uh, you know, we have very limited uh, sort of short-term debt and, you know, we have our convertible bond offering, which doesn't mature uh, for another four years. Uh, other than that, we don't have any debt, whereas some of the other miners have, you know, shorter term two-year notes at double-digit interest rates. Um, we just added another $100 million of liquidity through a term loan um, with Silvergate in addition to the $100 million we already had. Uh, at, you know, 7.65% interest. So, you know, very reasonable uh, financing. And uh, we have good liquidity, you know, um, our Bitcoin holdings are solid. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to, uh, as all these miners that we have in Texas now are being turned on every day, we're super excited about that. And then looking forward to, uh, you know, the expansion of our fleet here in the fall and into next year with Applied Blockchain where we'll be deploying uh, XPs, which uh, we're super excited about because 66% of our hash rate production will be using the most energy efficient mining rigs in the world. So we're super excited about that too. 
Interesting. So I did see that Marathon's Bitcoin production slumped by 44% from the previous quarter. Is that due to the energy crisis in Texas? And you mentioned that they're all online now. So I suppose the, the, you, no, you guys that, are so over the, that challenge. Um, yeah, so the, the reason the Bitcoin production was down was due to our Hardin, Montana facility. So the Hardin, Montana facility, uh, which I believe were the pictures you just had up, um, that is essentially a coal-fired plant in Montana that we announced we were exiting earlier this year. Um, and we'll be exiting that over the course of um, this month and uh, into September a little bit. Um, and so that facility got hit by a storm, the same storm that knocked out Yellowstone Park, uh, hit the facility, it knocked out the power generating station, and the power generating station hasn't been online kind of since. Before that, uh, it had maintenance issues and was operating kind of limping along. So for Q2, most of our mining production, um, our hash rate was predominantly out of the Montana facility, and that limped along. So that's what impacted the um, mining production. The new facility in Texas only just came online over the weekend. So that's a whole new facility that'll be 68,000 miners when fully deployed at the end of September. So, you know, doubling what we had online in, in Montana before, and then we continue to deploy up to the 23.3x hash by mid next year. Fred, with the Ethereum merge coming up in September, possibly, does that impact your business at all? No, I mean, the. Uh, it, it would impact it in the way that if uh, you know the price of Bitcoin is impacted by the Ethereum merge, but the Ethereum merge doesn't impact mining, doesn't impact the price of electricity, it doesn't impact the uh, global hash rate. Um, it may impact the price of Bitcoin. Um, we, you know, my personal belief on the price of Bitcoin is I think we're going to keep grinding in this kind of high teens, low mid twenties for a period to come here until there's a little bit more clarity around. Uh, the Fed's long-term intentions. And then I think Bitcoin will be one of the first asset classes to react to um, you know, a lessening of interest rate increases. And so you know, our expectation, uh, generally speaking, is um, early next year, we'll start seeing Bitcoin moving upwards again. But for the balance of this year, expect it to kind of sit in this level. So but Marathon that's not investment advice to anybody. Any Ethereum. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, no, none at all. Um, and if, if and if proof of stake does work, does that at least seriously challenge the benefits of proof of work mining because of the energy it consumes? No. So this is um, a quasi religious discussion um, that the Bitcoin maximalists uh, are very fervent over and the Ethereum maximalists on their side are very fervent over. Um, essentially, one of the challenges with proof of stake is it's very similar to a centralized banking system. You have entities who determine what transactions are valid, what transactions aren't, and the ones who get to determine that are driven by who holds the most ether. And uh, if you look today, based on the Ethereum that's been staked, uh, or the ether that's been staked, um, you know, there's a lot of concentration. It, there are four or five companies or entities really control the vast majority of the ether that's been staked. So it's kind of as if you had four major banks determining what transactions are going to be valid or not. And when single parties have that much of control, the whole discussion of decentralization is off the table. So you could essentially say that in a centralized proof of stake model, like the way Ethereum operates here, um, until you get a higher level of decentralization, it's very centralized. It can be forked. You know, you just look at all the discussions going on now in the Bitcoin world. That can't happen. Uh, you have huge amount of decentralization. Sure. You have much higher degree of security, and you know these changes that a handful of parties can make decisions on can't happen in Bitcoin. Just go back to the Segwit wars in 2017, and you can see how difficult it is to get anything kind of through in Bitcoin. Positives and negatives to that, but. Uh, we are hearing from some miners who are saying that they want to fork away from uh, Ethereum, staked Ethereum, if you will, and continue a proof of work chain uh, just to keep that going. But in, in any event, heading into Q3, what is Marathon intending to do in, in terms of business growth expansion and your general outlook on Bitcoin while you're at it? Yeah, so. Um you know, we're focused on uh, you know, continuing to deploy miners. Uh, our Texas site will be fully operational with 68,000 miners by the end of this quarter. Um, and as we then go into Q4, we begin deploying uh, in the other Texas site with a live blockchain. And then at the end of this year and into early next year, the North Dakota site. 
So we were very focused, sort of, you know, heads down, focused on deploying miners. Um, in regards to the price of Bitcoin, as I kind of mentioned earlier, I think we're going to see Bitcoin kind of grind along in this kind of high teens, low 20s area um, as it tries to find kind of um, some news that's going to drive a further accumulation. There's not a whole lot of volume uh, in the market today. Uh, we're starting to see the longs come back in on the option side. But I think, uh, you know, longer term, uh, you know, the price is going to go up. It just needs kind of the macroeconomic environment to kind of go a little bit less hawkish, a little bit more dovish. And then I think, as I said earlier, Bitcoin's going to move very quickly when that happens and people start looking to how to generate yield on their assets.